Dr. Sage here. Today, we're gonna cover vertebrates. So vertebrates were within the phylum chordata. Chordates are deuterosome coleomates. Remember that echinoderms are also deuterosomes. Within the phylum chordata, we have the subphylum euochordata, which are invertebrate chordates. That's the tunicates. We also have the subphylum cephalochordata, which are also invertebrate chordates, and those are the lancelets. We briefly discussed these two in the previous chapter's lecture. In this chapter's lecture, we're gonna focus on the subphylum vertebrata, which is the vertebrates. All chordates have four characteristics, at least some point during their development. It might only be during embryonic development, but they all have a notochord, which is a flexible rod-shaped structure that runs along the nerve cord. In vertebrates, the notochord will develop into the vertebrae. They all have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, which in vertebrates, this develops into the spinal cord. They all have pharyngeal slits, which in vertebrate fish, this develops into gill supports. While in tetrapods, tetra, that prefix means four, pod means limbed, so these are four limbed animals. So in tetrapods, the pharyngeal slits develop into parts of the ears and tonsils. And then they all have a postanal tail, at least during embryonic development. So within the phylum chordata, first you have the invertebrates that we briefly talked about in the last chapter as a quick refresher. You have the uochordata, which are the tunicates. The larva is modal, so it can move, it can swim. While the adults are sessile, so they're attached to the ocean floor and they're filter feeders. Then you have the subphylum cephalochordata, which is the lancelets. Okay, and again, we talked about this in the last chapter. So in this chapter, we're gonna focus on the vertebrates. Okay, the vertebrates have a cranium, which has either cartilage or bony or fibrous structure surrounding the brain. They also have a vertebral column, hence the name vertebrates. Within the subphylum fibrata, you have fish, which you have different types of fish. You have jawless fish, jawed fish, which is fish with cartilage, or bony fish, which is ray-finned or lobe-finned. Then you have amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And we're gonna go through each of these categories. So starting with the jawless fish, you can have hagfish or lampreys. Then you have the jawed fish. Okay, jawed fish are called nathosomes. The evolution of jaws allowed vertebrates to exploit food sources not available to jawless fish. It allows grasping and tearing of food sources. Within the jawed fish, you have the chondrothyces, which are fish that have cartilage instead of bone. Then you have the bony fish, which is the ostrocythes. Okay, there are two types, the ray-finned and the lobe-finned. The chondrocythes, okay, these have cartilage, not bone. This is sharks, <coughs> skates, rays. They're the dominant predators of the ocean. Their skeleton is made up of cartilage, and they have evolution of teeth, which is modified placoid scales. Among these, the sharks have a keen sense of smell. They can also detect electromagnetic fields of living things. They also have a lateral line, which detects movement and vibrations in the water, and bony fish also have this lateral line. Then you have the bony fish, the astocythes. They have gills covered by opiculum, and they have a swim bladder, which helps them with buoyancy. Out of the bony fish, you have the ray fin fish and the lobe fin fish. The bone structures are in the pectoral fins, which allows for support, which over the evolutionary time scale, that allows the adaptation for migration to land. Okay, so for example, evolution of lobe fin fish led to the tetrapod amphibians. So this would be the ancestor of the amphibians. In fact, there's an ancestor called Tikalik. It, found, it was found that it was the link between the lobe fin fishes and the four-legged amphibians. So this was the evolutionary link between these two. So then you have the amphibians, which are tetrapods. They have four limbs. They live on the land, but they're still tied to water. Their skin has to stay moist because they do gas exchange through their skin. Some amphibians also have lungs and some have gills. And their eggs are laid in the water, not on the land. Types of amphibians, well, you have the salamanders. Some have gills and some have lungs, and they have internal fertilization. 
Then you have the frogs and toads, which have external fertilization, and a body plan that's specialized for movement, in particular jumping. Then you have the Sicilians, which are legless amphibians. So it was an evolutionary reversal. An ancestor had legs and they lost those legs. Next, we have the amniotes, which are the reptiles, birds, and mammals. They're called amniotes because they have an egg protected by amniotic membranes. The first amniotes evolved from amphibian ancestors approximately 340 million years ago. The initial split was into synapsids and sauropsids. Synapsids have one temporal festrosia, and that's the mammals, whereas uh, sauropsids, uh, which are made up of two types, anapsids and diapsids, the anapsids have no temporal festrosia, that'd be the turtles, the diapsids have two temporal frustrata, that's the birds and reptiles. So, let me explain what that's actually saying. So, the synapsids, those are mammals, okay, have one of these temporal frustratas. Okay, you can see that here. The anapsids, those are the turtles, they don't have that structure. Whereas the diapsids, those are birds and reptiles, they have two of these temporal fenstratas. Okay, the reptiles and birds are divided into the leptozoars, which are lizards, snakes, and totoras, and the archozoars, which are dinosaurs, crocodiles and alligators, and birds. Okay, the reptiles are tetrapods, four limbs, although snakes have secondarily lost their limbs. They have scaly skin, and they're ectotherms, which means their body heat is dependent upon the environment. That's why you see things like snakes and alligators laying out in the sun to generate heat to warm up their bodies. Then you have the dinosaurs, which are the dominant vertebrates until 65 million years ago. They might have been endothermic, generating their own body heat. There is evidence of paternal care, and dinosaurs are considered to be more closely related to modern day birds and crocs, and not as much to other modern day reptiles. So within the reptiles, you have the crocodilia, which are the crocodiles and the alligators. You have the totoras, which is only two living species, which are living in uh, New Zealand. Then you have the squamata, which are the lizards and the snakes. This is the largest group of reptiles. They're found everywhere on this planet except Antarctica, and they're a very diverse group. Then you have the turtles and the birds. Now birds are endothermic. They generate their own body heat, much like dinosaurs probably did. They have a high metabolic rate because flight is very metabolically expensive and they have modifications for flight. So they have feathers, which are modified scales, which also aid in insulation. They have hollow bones to make them weigh less so it's easier to fly, uh, sternum in the shape of a keel and efficient respiration. Now the evolution is still a little bit unclear, but birds are more closely related to dinosaurs than to modern day reptiles. In fact, you can see this fossil here is of Araptitis, which is an important fossil because it was the intermediate species between dinosaurs and birds. In other words, the dinosaurs did not all fully go extinct. Some of them evolved into modern day birds. Next, we have mammals. Okay, mammals are endothermic, generate their own body heat. They have hair, they have mammary glands, so they produce milk, and they have uh, types of teeth which indicate what type of diet they have. Among the animals, we have monotremes, which are the platypus and the echinideas. These are mammals that lay eggs, and they have leathery, like turtle-type eggs. They have no teeth. Then we have the marsupials. So in the marsupials, the embryo continues development in a pouch. You find these mainly in Australia, where they have lots of marsupials, like kangaroos and koala bears. However, in North America, we only have one species of marsupial, and that's the possum. Then you have the euthridians, which are most of the mammals. These are the true placental mammals. Within the euthridians, you have the primates, which is made up of the lemurs, monkeys, apes, and humans. You have the prosimians, which have a smaller brain, and they're nocturnal. These are animals like lemurs or bush babies. Then you have the anthropoids, which are the monkeys, apes, and humans. Now, the anthropoids are divided into the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys. The Old War monkeys were found originally in Africa and Asia. Apes, which have no tails and spend most of their time on the ground and they're more intelligent. Chimps, which is one of the humans' closest living relatives. Gorillas, orangutans, and humans. 
Then you have the New World monkeys, originating in South America. Within the order of primates, you have the hominids or hominoids, which are the chimps, gorillas, and humans. Of interest, the humans, in particular our species is called Homo sapiens, appeared about 200,000 years ago. However, we are not the only human-like organism to have lived on this planet. In fact, you've probably heard of another related species called Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalis. Okay, but there were many different human-like hominids that lived on this planet. We have the Homo neanderthalis, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, etc. These are all basically early human ancestors. We're actually going to go into more detail on that subject in the next video lecture. And the next video lecture is going to be different from the videos you watched so far. It's going to be a little more interactive. It's kind of going to be like a choose your own adventure. Okay, now the total video, set of videos will only take you about nine minutes to watch. But what happens, you're gonna watch a couple minute video and then choose which video you want to watch next after that. And then watch that, and then choose the next one, etc. until you finish through the series of videos. So you do need to watch that full series of videos by choosing at the end of each video which one you're gonna watch next. You'll see what I mean whenever you watch that first video because I explain, and you'll see that linked here. Okay. So until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.